So, my memory is very good, and this woman was very emphatic. This memory of yours is so important. Use this tool, it will help further you. And she said, and these were the two symbols I saw, but the most important symbol of all, she said, and that always came over to me, and she says, and I still don't understand it. She says, I see the symbol of a leaf. It's like a maple leaf, but it's not like a maple leaf, she says. I don't know what kind of leaf it is. She says, it's a, it's a leaf that has a lot of ridges around it. She, and, and I could hear her on the phone sort of trying to describe it. It's a, like a maple leaf, but not like a maple leaf. It's got ridges, it, it's, you know, they're all uniform fronds and they all have ridges and she says, do you know what kind of leaf that is? Now the funny thing is I didn't know what kind of leaf that was. This is 1977. I wouldn't even smoke marijuana for another four years until in 1981. Right, where a lot of things happened in later years. Like, even though I'm getting told this in 1977, it means nothing to me, really. Right, symbol of the dollar. But what happens is, she says, so she goes on about this leaf being very important. She says, this leaf is important to your whole destiny. It's important to a whole bunch of people. And she said, and you're going to lead a group of people, a big multitude of people, under the banner of this leaf. And she says, and, and, and it, it, I couldn't get rid of this. She said, for three weeks I saw these three symbols and your name, and I was new, I had to tell you. She said, does this mean anything to you, Mark Emery? And I go, no, it doesn't. But thank you for telling me, right? <laughs> what am I supposed to say? She dropped nearly dead in front of my store, and she's holding me responsible. Because she said, it's because of me. She said, your whole essence was forced into my body, and it's like literally shoved my consciousness out of my form. I dropped to the street, next thing you know, I'm getting out of a hospital three weeks later. And all I know is that you were there for every moment that I was unconscious, right? And I'm going, wow, this is really heavy. And so anyway, she says, so I'm going to leave that with you, Mr. Emery. I don't know what to do about it. I hope it goes away. I want it out of my head. I hope I never think about you again. And I hope you, some, you can make some sense of this. Click. The phone goes. So a few years later, I'm reading Ayn Rand in my backyard, and I'm reading Atlas uh, Shrugged, which changes my whole way of life, mm -hmm. changes the whole way I look at everything. My whole life got, went in a real direction. I became like Howard Rourke personified in my own mind after that. But I read Atlas Shrugged, and at the center of the heroic struggle there is the symbol of the dollar, Galtz, 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 Galtz is dollar symbol over. And I thought, wow, not only am I good at money, but now I've discovered this philosophy, and strangely enough, the, the dollar symbol. My memory was always really good. My big dream is to be on Jeopardy. I still, to this day, <laughs> like to throw trivia. I even was responsible for writing 6,000 questions in a rock and roll trivia game, many of which I can still recite to you type of thing, right? So my memory has been, is very sharp. I understand this idea about the money because I've always been very deft. I earn millions every year and give so much of it away. I have this real ability to earn money, and so money is a wonderful tool to me. But this, only in 1981 would I smoke marijuana for the first time. A wonderful experience too. I was about to have sex with this woman. I'm in her kitchen. I can see the full moon. She's got constant comment, Mandarin Zinger. I remember everything about it. Sandra, uh, my great love, as it turns out. And I think she detected a bit of nervousness in me. I'm about to go down on the floor and start eating her. And all of a sudden she says, stop. Before you do that, and then for the first time ever, I know she's licking this joint close. I don't know what she's been doing while I've been ready to go down on her, but she's now got this joint in her mouth. She licks it. She says, let's smoke this first. And it was like, what a revelation. I smoked it and for the first time got really high. And so when I was licking your pussy, it wasn't like any pussy. It was like the wings of manta rays. I was <laughs> gliding over manta rays. I feel your skin is seemingly going on forever. And I feel this, wow, this is incredible. And so all of a sudden, for the first time in my life, it's broached to me that sex isn't about getting to the orgasm, isn't goal-oriented, which is what the lesson of marijuana is in its entirely. It's not about goals. It's not about getting to the final end of the journey. It's about enjoying the journey. If you enjoy the journey, it won't matter what your goal is. Yeah. It won't matter what goal you get because you don't always get what you want. You get what you get. So if it, that could be anything in life, so you better enjoy it however it comes. And that's what I learned that night licking her pussy. It wasn't about getting to my orgasm, it was about enjoying this beautiful, wonderful process. And one thing you become aware of after experience like that is life is very short. So anyway, this happens four years later and I discover the wonderful value of marijuana. But it would be years before I would actually become conscious politically aware of the terrible oppression that people who are enlightened by marijuana suffer and that we suffer this everywhere. And so it was 1990 that I decided I was going to do something for these people. I was going to do something for myself. I was going to do something for these people. And even then, I did not even recall this story, this recollection, this portent, until 1996 where I, when I was first interviewed and somebody asked me if I was a spiritual person. So here, hey, try this. So that now, in, in the year 2004, I can look back and say, oh my God, this woman nearly died in front of my store predicting a future of me. And here's what she said, though. She kept reiterating this message, along with the three symbols of the dollar sign, the, the mind like a steel trap, and the leaf, she said, which is the most important of all symbols. She said, don't give in to despair. 
Don't give in to self-pity. Don't give in to despair. It will be a rough road, but you will ultimately lead your people to freedom and greatness. And what you seek, you will seek what you are, you will get what you are seeking. But she said, but you must not give in to self-pity and self-despair because she said that will be your undoing, so you must remember this. And she said, and then she concluded and left me, right? And now I realize that, wow, what an amazing foretelling that a woman nearly dies, spends three weeks in hospital in a coma at age 65, 67, is very frightened for her life, very nervous when she's talking to me, just to, get, and, and pass on these things to me, these portentions. Right? They're amazing. So, you know, there's always that one th part of me that says there must be some great high power. Because how could that happen? How could some woman collapse 20 feet in front of me? And she says, when she walked beside me, she knew in that free fact that my whole life was being forced into her. And then three weeks later, she's calling me up after getting out of a coma to tell me these things. So I believe I'm, I'm uh, destined for a very unique future and uh, that it's all unfolding as it's supposed to. And that marijuana is most helpful in this particular instance because it, no matter what happens, if I die as a part of this cause or crusade, if I, uh, if I get in prison for lengths of time, and as you know, I recently just went to jail uh, for a three month sentence just for passing one joint. And I was really, I felt epiphany when I was there. I felt great changes in me. First of all, I was no longer afraid of jail. When I got out, I realized, hey, I can do this. I can do this. I felt terrific. I really liked my time in jail. I mean, the truth be told, I was able to think clearly. I wrote extensively and I read a lot and I learned a lot about the world around me, about the people I represent, the people who are too poor and so illiterate. They're never, they never had a chance and they're never going anywhere. These are the people I met in jail. And I befriended them and learned a lot about them. Very valuable time. But I also realized, hey, I can spend a lot of my time in jails over the rest of my life, leading my people out of this bondage. When you've got millions and millions of marijuana people that are going to jail and being being harassed and hunted like dogs around the world and in Canada and North America, I felt really at home realizing that this is my destiny, that I was going to be going to jail an awful lot. So it's funny what you can be comfortable with, but that there is this one thing, there is this one incident in my life that cannot be explained in other than that some extraordinary higher power has taken a hand in my life and done something special. See, I often think it's arrogant and egotistical to think, you know, that God is actually noticing any one of us, right? Right, like but, I'm uh, but, but I have no other explanation than somebody, somewhere, has a design for me.